Good morning. It's an honor to be with you. Happy New Year. Yeah, I, the last time I was here, so we've missed all the holidays. We've like kind of gone through all the holidays. So it's just a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, I wasn't completely sure. Some of you may know that I've been working on this series of um, ser sermons called The Myth Of. And I wasn't really sure if there was one in this idea of law, but I found one. <laughs> so um, in essence, what I want to talk a little bit with you about is the myth of community. Because when we look at the idea of law and the idea of universal spiritual principles, all of that is grounded in a communal understanding, not just in solo practitioner of whatever we believe to be true or whatever we believe to be so. So I you know, am a fan of Merriam-Webster when it comes to these things because you know, it's very easy for uh, terms and phrases to turn into jargon. So we can say universal spiritual principles and assume that we're all talking about the same thing and really very easily be talking about very different things. So one of the things that I like to try and do is look and see, well, what are the inner workings of these words we've got strung together? So if we think about principles or a principle, a comprehensive and fundamental law, doctrine, or assumption, or a rule of code or conduct. So the question that I would ask for you to consider over time, not just during this talk, is what are the rules of conduct that are currently, that you're currently living your life through? What's your moral compass right now? Because that actually will tell you, lean into and give you a little bit of insight into, well, what are the principles you're living your life by? One way to find out is to look at the results of your life. What's actually happening? What are you manifesting? that may show you actually what the principles are. Distinct from a principle, what's a law? They're very, sim they're very similar, they're very close, but the law is a binding custom or practice of a community. It's binding. There's agreement. Everyone is working together in similar ways and it's a rule of conduct or action prescribed or formally recognized as binding or enforced by a controlling authority. So often when we think about law from the secular perspective, we're thinking about what are the systems that we have in place to actually keep people from doing bad things and who do we have on deck to control and make sure that laws are enforced separate from people governing themselves and managing themselves. So if we think about this from a spiritual perspective, thinking about spiritual law and spiritual principle, then I would ask, what are the binding customs and or practices that as a member of this spiritual community, you agree and you can agree physically by your actions, you agree emotionally, by the way in which you regard the community, the prayers that you offer, the thoughts that you have for the community, and or verbally, what do you actually say about the community, about being a member of it? Are your words words of creation and power, or are your words of criticism and destruction? It's something to consider because if we're talking about law, then we have to look at what are the things that we're all communally saying about being in spiritual partnership? Because that's what a spiritual community is. Whether you're in for a day or you're in for every day of your life, it is a moment of spiritual partnership that gets built over time ongoingly. And then this idea of spiritual principles, and not just spiritual principles, but universal ones. So the universe is kind of big. It's kind of big. It's not like we can get our hands all the way around it. And there's one website that I found called 
allisnow.com. And on that website, they have as a partial beginning list of spiritual principles, 42 identified. And that's not an exhaustive list. That's just like that pink spoon at Baskin Robbins, just a little taste <laughs> of spiritual principles. And the other idea about spiritual principles is that part of the idea of universal spiritual principle is part principle, but then it's also part spiritual practice. So there's the idea of the spiritual principle, but then there's what are you doing with that spiritual principle? Are you just thinking about it? Or is it actually a lived part of your life and your interactions with other people? So then comes the question, what are the spiritual principles that you live by? For real. You know, what are the spiritual principles that you live by? And then what makes a spiritual principle universal? And generally what makes a spiritual principle universal is that it is seen across a variety of traditions. There's evidence of it, or evidence at least of the belief of more than just us here, that it is universal, that it is something that can be experienced or put into the words or actions of groups of people around the world. Those of us who operate in the psychic realm actually pull in information beyond the physical. But that's what we're talking about, something that's agreed upon, let's say, around the planet, and then comes the practice of it, because really, if we look at what's happening in the world today, if we look at the actual results that are being produced, whether we look locally or whether we look abroad to instances in Paris and other places around the world that don't get televised as much, then there are certain practices that are either in play or they're practices that we need to beef up how we're actually living these spiritual principles. So the first myth, if we look into this idea of the myth of community, is that your morals are the right ones. Just yours are really the right one, the real right ones. <laughs> Not kind of the, you know, squishy ones, kind of earthy crunch ones, but the real right morals are the ones you have. And if everyone would just kind of do it your way, then everything would just kind of get figured out. And what we believe to be right or wrong is influenced by so many factors. So it can be influenced by our background, our personal history, the wrongs we've experienced, as well as the wrongs we've committed and gotten away with because there are those. Those things that we've done that nobody really knows about, that we think is kind of like in the dark and in the past and in history, but they're things that we've done and gotten away with. And that becomes, it alters our moral compass. It shifts it a little bit. There's the immediate environment that we're in that contributes to what, what we think of as right and wrong. Our families both the ones that we are born through, as well as the ones that we create. Our work, our dreams, and our beliefs. So it's not like your spiritual beliefs and the spiritual principles that you live by are the only things that are influencing how you think of the world as right or wrong, or what you think of as wrong or right action. One of the spiritual principles that's on that website has to do with, and it says this, remaining open-minded and teachable, much like a child, remaining pliable like clay. So you might want to ask yourself, <laughs> is there any room to explore and practice more of what you believe. What's your current childlike experience of your spirituality? Are you inquisitive about things? Are, do you accept?
experiment with the universe around you? Um, is your spirituality really like a playground? Or is it a prison where you don't feel like you're meeting up to the spiritual principle? Or that because of, since you have the right morals, other people are not living up to the spiritual principles. And if they would start living up to the spiritual principle, then things would just get better. But again, we shift the focus away. Or are you perhaps the spiritual bully on the playground? Like when you show up, what you want is to make everybody do what you want. And then there are consequences if, you, if, if they don't. A place to look and see because pretty much children operate like that and all of those things. And then over time, we teach them that what they do is who they are. Up until a particular point, children are just kind of fascinated, like, ooh, keys, shiny, <laughs> warm, fun, bad, cold, mean, very, very simple. But then we, at, over time, teach them to believe that those experiences are either them or not them. So you've got to look and see, in this community, can you create this spiritual community so you can play? So you can actually practice and play with spiritual principles? Or is this going to become another place, or a simpler way to say it, is it going to become a judgment factory? And you have, the, you have everything to say about how that goes. The second myth is that somehow you have mastered a spiritual principle. Like you figured out love thy neighbor. You've got that down pat, you know how to, when that banana bread comes out of that oven, <laughs> then you are all set to go. But really, I mean, the, the thing about it is, is that spiritual principles, we have examples of the mastery of spiritual principles. Some traditions call them the prophets. Some traditions call them the master teachers. It all depends on your perspective. But we have example. And it's not just about recreating what we've seen. But part of being a spiritual being is actually looking inside yourself and seeing what is the spiritual principle and practice that I live by that may not be written down anywhere else. It may not even be recorded in spiritual history yet, but it is so a part of me that ultimately I don't even have to say anything about it. People start imitating it. They just start doing it. It's interesting that when we look at the master teachers like the Buddha, like Muhammad, like Jesus, none of them had any interest in actually creating a church. None of them had any interest in actually bringing people together in physical structures to be like them. They weren't per se even completely given over to the idea that they were an example of anything. But what they were doing is pursuing spiritual principle by practice. If we can separate from ourselves that we have to be masters now, then we could actually begin to explore spiritual principle and practice honestly and wholly and fully, as well as be able to say where the roadblocks are. You know, the interesting thing about the golden rule, the idea of treat others the way you would like to be treated, the golden rule, that language, is a secular description of spiritual practice. You don't read in, in, text, in um, sacred text, there is no such thing as the golden rule. It doesn't exist, there's no language for that. That's something that the world created to be able to talk about the experience of treating each other the way we would like to be treated. But at least in the Bible, here's what's interesting. That is actually the second and most important commandment, not the first. The first is that thou shalt love thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. That's actually the golden rule. 
is to actually love whatever you believe God to be with everything you've got. And then, after you've done that, then the first is likened unto the second, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So to a certain degree, it's a little bit of a fool's errand to try and love your neighbors as yourself if you have no connection to spirit. Because what is actually loving your neighbor is not spiritually guided. And so part of this whole process is you, to figure out what is that whole experience of you loving God or spirit or divine mind or however you embrace that which is greater than you, how do you actually give your whole self to it? Because in that moment, you are sharing, you are, you are wanting something more for your neighbor than you currently do. Sometimes we just want our neighbor not to come by. Because <laughs> we don't want to be bothered with anybody in that particular moment. We're just kind of like, oh, please don't let anybody ring the doorbell. If anybody rings that doorbell, I think I'll just jump out the window. And that's what our neighbor has access to. So we have to be mindful that when we start talking about embodying spiritual principle, which is who we are at, at New Thought Spiritual Center, we, I have it written down here, we, that embodies and celebrates universal spiritual principles. That embodying part, that takes a little something. It's a, it's a practice in mindfulness to know when we're actually calling forth and not necessarily working within spiritual principle or spiritual practice, but we're actually treating our neighbors like crap pretty much because in the moment we're treating ourselves like crap. And it's not really a mystery to me. We can look at very, very clear specifics within the world in, way, in which it's operating right now, but this whole idea of terrorism, et cetera, it is a breakdown in the spiritual practice of love thy neighbor. And what we're often sharing with our neighbor is the fear and the terror in our own hearts that is unresolved and kind of running rampant and not paying any attention to it and not seeing ourselves somehow as cause of all of this. And if we can't see ourselves as cause of it, then we certainly can't see ourselves as the corrector of it. It'll always live outside of us. And true spiritual power comes from within. It's not something that gets accessed from the outside. So, something to consider in terms of this myth of community, rather than concerning ourselves with whether we've mastered a spiritual principle or not, we could concern ourselves with whether we're living the spiritual principles that we say are important to us in this community. Are we actually living them? That we're being mindful, that we're being kind, that we're being generous. Are we actually doing that? Let's bring the bar down a little bit. The third myth is that you need the right people in your community. That if you could just get the right people, just the right, you know, just really like committed and engaged and really thoughtful people, if we could just get those people as opposed to the ones we have. <laughs> Because the ones we have, they're okay, but nothing's really going to happen with them. We're really not going to grow if those people stay. You know what I mean? And that's like a conversation over coffee. You may have had this experience at some point where you're either on a team or it's at work or even within your family and you kind of get put with someone on a team and you're just kind of like, oh God, <laughs> this is just not gonna go well. God, 
yeah, okay, yeah, I'm ready, yeah. And some very interesting bargaining that goes on in that moment. You know, you, and then of course it all comes back to us because we are, you know, so magnanimous and have mastered these spiritual principles and we're the right people. So it's, I'm gonna be the bigger person here. Are you now? Really, that's so selfless of you. <laughs> and I'm not gonna let them take this over with their craziness. She is not going to run this thing. I'm sorry I said I would do it in the first place if I knew I was gonna have to work with her. So what's interesting is, is that all of this happens in the absence of another spiritual principle. If you will, it's the not deployment of this spiritual principle, which is monitoring one's stream of thoughts in an effort to maintain positivity and compassion, closely related to mindfulness of the present moment. Because if it is, that we are living in an abundant universe, that the creator is providing all that we need, that we are whole, perfect, and complete, living among whole and perfect and complete beings. If that's the case, then really what's the big problem? What we miss by not being mindful is that I'm not the most generous person in the world. So likely, whenever I show up, there's gonna be an opportunity for me to learn generosity. Or, you know, I, since I was little, have a problem really expressing love. So likely, anywhere I show up is gonna be an opportunity for me to express love in some way. Why would a loving, spiritual entity have it any other way that I am always presented with the opportunity to grow, to practice the spiritual principles that I say I believe in and that guide my life. The missed opportunity is in somehow thinking that in your spiritual community, the perfect people for your growth and development as a spiritual person are not present. From the person that cut you off on your way here, to the person who leaves something in your driveway or leaves something at the door. Everything, 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 everything is an opportunity for us to practice spiritual principle and belief. Everything, every moment is an opportunity for us to practice what we say we believe. And our community, this community, can be in a mind, in a moment, <coughs> excuse me, in a moment of mindfulness, what we're grateful for. We acknowledge and celebrate the union of all that is present. We are grateful for the opportunity for our highest good to be made manifest. We are thankful for the community we're in to experience the divine. That could be the language. And I'm going to suggest that as you're journeying through this idea of what does it mean to embody and to celebrate universal spiritual practices, I invite you to be mindful of your language, of your community. Because in your language, your community will either thrive or die. Things that don't grow, die. And we see growth here. This community is growing, it's burgeoning, and we want to stay mindful because it's very easy to slip and f slip into something's wrong. And as soon as something becomes wrong, you have a problem. And you've stopped being mindful. <laughs>
of the moment. It is so wonderful that you've actually created a bar to move toward, to embody and celebrate universal spiritual practice. And that's going to take something. And no one person can do it for everybody. Everyone has their own journey, and the revelation in all of those journeys combined together will make your community stronger. The last thing that I'm going to say is that in regards to the idea of universal spiritual principle, God has not stopped revealing itself. So when we look at universal spiritual principle, we're pretty much looking at the sometimes repackaging or sometimes the use of what has already come. What is God revealing to you that you've never heard anybody say before? What is God revealing to you and showing up and in your dreams and in your relationships with people? What's the new thing for you and God to be working on? Because in that is the development of that embodying and celebration of universal spiritual practice. Thank you so much. God bless you.